Ah, all righty. My intention over the next few weeks is to systematically go through some foundational teachings from the tantric lineages. And today's earmarked for the, the fruits of practice, the fruits of the path, the goals of the path. And what I noticed when I was reflecting on this, I feel like this is a teaching I've given so many times. And there's a part of me that's like, how do I go into this again? Like, do I want to go into this again? I've you know, given it so many times. And, when, and the realization of wanting to feel the aliveness, wanting to feel the, the freshness. And this, this sort of pulsation of life is that when we start to know something or believe or feel as if we know something, it starts to become more conceptual. It starts to go more into the intellect. And then we're speaking from that place. And to stay with aliveness, to stay with presence, to stay with sahaja, sahaja is the spontaneous arising of things, right, is part of this journey. And so that's my challenge, you know, to myself as a teacher is to speak to this and not to go into habit, not to go into pattern, not to go into the well-worn ruts as such and to see what arises. Um, and so, yeah, if there's any questions that pop up along the way, just feel free to, to drop them into chat. Um, and if you, you know, if you want to say something on on camera, just drop in the chat, and then I'll I'll bring you in. Okay, so it's really useful to know what the goals or the fruits of a particular path are, just to ensure that what you want is actually what's delivered by the path, because different paths have different goals. For example, classical yoga. Um, epitomized by, say, uh, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, is very much a transcendent path. It's about transcending the body. Uh, and that's great if that's what it is that you want to do. However, if you're a, you know, a 21st century householder and you're very much living with, you know, you, you work in your job and you have a family and you're doing all these things, Maybe toward the end of your responsibilities in your 70s or 80s, you might want to go into a, tra a transcendent path. But right now, you're here in the physical body. And so you may be more interested in a tantric path, for example, which is embodied liberation. So the path itself is about living here in the world um, and enjoying life. Right? This, is, this is a key difference between classical yoga and tantra, uh, is that tantra actually says this is about enjoying life, enjoying a sunset, enjoying music, you know, enjoying the sensory experience of being a human, of like soaking it up. Um, and that is a key difference between Tantra and many other philosophies is that they don't mention the enjoyment of life. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's one key goal or fruit, enjoyment. Um, the Sanskrit word for it is boga. And then the other two within Tantra are awakening and liberation, moksha. And what, what I want to reflect on today, which is taking a different route to, through this to me, is the reduction or the ending of suffering. Right? Because when there is awakening and when there is liberation, what unfolds there is that there is a decrease in or an ending of suffering. And so what I'm starting to recognize and feel is that some people coming onto the spiritual path, they might not necessarily want to wake up as, they might not want to be enlightened. Um, and they might not even really care about liberation to a degree. However, most people coming onto the path want to suffer less, whatever it is that they're suffering is. And so I'm beginning to feel like framing it in that way that, oh, it's, it's about freedom from suffering is far more relatable, right? And so what does that mean, freedom from suffering? It's not that we can control the circumstances of our life. Shit's going to happen. But through practice, we literally rewire the brain. Um, there's an amazing podcast I'm listening to right now by a guy who's a neurosurgeon, biologist, scientist, I can't quite remember, and a really dedicated yoga practitioner and teacher. And when he describes, oh my God, it's so incredible listening to him, because he will talk about doing specific meditative practices 
and then he will articulate exactly what is happening in the brain with the amygdala and the hippocampus and the neocortex and why it's having the impact that it's having. And having someone like him who can speak two languages, in essence, a language of neuroscience and the language of yoga, translating between the two is absolutely extraordinary. And so listening to him, what I'm realizing is that, you know, it's often said that yoga is a science and yet in the Western world, it's it's often seen as something that is mystical and the spiritual path, etc. However, what we're doing when we do practice is very specifically designed to work with our perception of reality and to work with the way that the brain is functioning and therefore the way that we are perceiving reality as well. Um, and so we're we're working on the interface of this apparent individual with this apparent external reality, you see, and in doing so, decreasing suffering, right? So on a practical level, that means that, say, a particular situation triggers you into intense anger and you're suffering because of that. Uh, if you're on the path, it's like, okay, what can I do? Well, you, you can go in, for example, and increase your capacity and your ability and your willingness to be able to fully feel that anger at the root, the samskara, so it completely dissolves, and then you are no longer triggered by those same situations with the anger, and so you're no longer suffering in those moments. And that is liberation, right? That That's the way I often frame it. It's like liberation. But liberation from what? I've been looking at it from the perspective, well, it's liberation from the pattern. It's liberation from the habit. But the, the benefit of that is that it's liberating you from the suffering that you're experiencing in the moment, you see. Mm. So awakening is often portrayed, you know, by mainstream media, et cetera, as like something that just like, bam, happens in, in one burst and all of a sudden you're this incredible enlightened being sort of a la Eckhart Tolle on the park bench when he was 30. Uh, however, talk to like when I listen to Christopher Wallace or I listen to some other teachers what they speak about is that it's more often than not a gradual 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 process of the loosening of self images the loosening of identity and the gradual knowing oneself as awareness and it is the clinging to identity or the clinging to self images that often will generate suffering and a really good example of that for example, is say you are a high-powered athlete making millions of dollars uh, and you have a massive injury and all of a sudden you can no longer be an athlete. Uh, you're no longer, you know, let's just say there's a fall from grace and you're no longer famous, you're not a celebrity. You know, the, the trappings of that all fall away and it's like, who am I now? And if you were very attached to that identity, if you are deriving a sense of uh, self-worth from that identity, et cetera, there will be immense suffering in that transition that is unfolding. Whereas if you really know yourself as awareness and there's a recognition that this is just a happening that is temporary and it will always come to an end because athleticism always ends eventually one way or another. And there's an ability to be fully present and grateful and enjoy while it's there then when the uh, that happening starts to dissolve and end, there will naturally be grief, of course, because there is loss, there is transition, there is change, but there won't necessarily be the degree of suffering. And what this means is that if you're looking you know, at your life, you can just choose any part of your life where you're experiencing suffering and just determine whether you're placing the um, the mm, source of that suffering outside of yourself i'm suffering because of these circumstances or whether you're willing to take radical ownership of that suffering and recognize that the spiritual path offers you practices and tools and ways of dissolving what is ever actually causing the suffering which is never external to us and always internal to us um, and this is the liberation work this is the liberation work which it's interesting the relationship between awakening and liberation. As we begin to soften the identity, we're no longer clinging or defending as much as we once were. There is less suffering 
and the patterns themselves get a little bit weaker and so they will liberate with more ease. As the patterns liberate, there is less gunkiness and less uh, attachment and less, mm, we're less possessed by identity with the story of me, et cetera. And so the awakening becomes easier. So those two things dance back and forth. Now, there, this is not a linear thing in terms of when I've liberated all my shit, then I'll be awakened. Or once I'm awakened, there'll be nothing more to liberate. The teachings as I received them from Christopher Wallace are like, you can actually be fully awakened, which means you know yourself as awareness. There's that real, that, I'm that, right? And also the patterns and the karmic tendencies can still be playing out but they're not necessarily causing as much or possibly any um, suffering, but they're still happening. They're still happening. Um, the way Wallace teaches it, he basically says that if there's full liberation, that you, there's no more incarnation, that full liberation actually, because what's the point? <laughs> um, and, and, but he said, you know, the way that he frames it is like, even the physical body is a form of sanskara. It's a form of pattern. So if there's full liberation, there's no more body left, um, which is a really interesting rabbit hole that we will not go down today. So if you're on the spiritual path, just to summarize this, if you're on the spiritual path, and you're starting to get a sense of which lineage or which path that you would like to mostly devote to and follow, right? Building on the work from last time you talked about view teachings, being really clear that the particular path that you're walking, that the view teachings and the, the goals of the path actually line up with what it is that you're here to do, how you're here to be. So if you, if you want to transcend classical yoga, for example, uh, if you want to have embodied liberation, tantric yoga. Um, and then getting getting clear, because a lot of people, and this goes into sort of what we'll talk about next week, a lot of a lot of us, including me, we come to the path because we we don't want to suffer anymore. But part of that is we're chasing the high or avoiding the pain, right? And that chasing and avoidance is the actual pattern that is causing the suffering. And we bring that pattern of chasing and avoiding onto the path. And we orientate to the path from that perspective. And so we're not actually, not that this is linear at all, because it's never, but we're not really moving towards the goal because we're stuck in doing the same thing in our so-called spiritual life that we were doing in our so-called mainstream or material life, you see. And so... It really, it, it really does this help to just clarify your desire. Why are you here? Why are you here on this path? Why are you showing up to these teachings? Why do you practice? What is it about for you? What is your deepest heart's desire? What is your longing? And to get in touch with that, to get in touch with that on the in the deepest possible way. Now, just one final piece on this. So we have enjoyment right, voga, and we have moksha, which is awakening and liberation, and the dance within tantra is that voga, enjoyment of life, is always subliminated to awakening and liberation, because otherwise you start to have hedonism, <laughs> right, so, and, and the thing about, you know, going too far into enjoyment, or it can become another form of suffering, because if you're attached to it, or you're in a version of things, it can, you know, you can generate new samskaras or new addictions or new whatevers. So there's a there's a discernment piece there within Tantra is what does it actually mean to enjoy without attachment, to be able to savor, you know, like if you're eating a you know chocolate cake, to just really give yourself over to the supreme pleasure of everything about that chocolate cake, from the way it smells to the way it looks to the way it feels, to the way it tastes, to what it's like in your body. And when you drop in and do that with 100% presence, then it's very unlikely that you will overeat the chocolate cake as such because the way you're moving is to really meet and be with the thing, uh, which is very, very different from the kind of apparent enjoyment that is more like a, 
I've got emotion coming up and I don't want to feel it. So I'm reaching for the cake and I'm stuffing it down and I'm not even really smelling it, tasting it, feeling it, seeing it. I'm just doing whatever's needed here so I don't feel that emotional thing. Two very different experiences of the same thing, eating a piece of chocolate cake. Um, and so being aware of the interplay between awakening, liberation, and enjoyment is really important. For a while there, I was probably somewhat too focused on the liberation, uh, dissolving all the things, etc. And I was forgetting to just pause and relax and enjoy. And then I started to realize, like, oh, shit, I'm grasping after liberation. My relationship to liberation right now is that of grasping. And so it softened, let go, and recognize that I'm unconsciously moving from this place of oh, when this is all healed, then I will, which is the inherent illusion of it, right? And this is the, the other aspect of the tantric teaching, the goals. It's all here right now you don't actually need to go anywhere do anything in this moment can you let go of the story of me and drop into knowing yourself as awareness immersing in that and just feeling that joy of beingness right that joy of beingness Mm. 